Good morning, uh, BBC. Amen. 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 Uh, see, some of our guys are here this morning. It's such a privilege uh, to be here. And, you know, when I think of BBC, I think of Paul's words where he says, I have no one of genuine interest that will be concerned about you except Timothy. Um, there's just such a spirit of genuineness, of authenticity um, with the church that's just beautiful to, to witness and beautiful to see. Um, even as we just grow in our relationship, getting to know our body more and, and just the church and, and just talking to you even um, during the service. And thank you for being so gracious. Thank you for being so gracious towards, uh, towards us. Um, my wife is here, as they said. Um, if she can stand, please. I love... Uh, she's my, she's my, uh, she's my only wife, and I love her with my heart, my pancreas, my everything that's inside of me. I just want to acknowledge her, and it's just a joy to do ministry with her, and to see the grace of God that's working in her life. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five. Um, Luke chapter five. If you have it, say amen. amen. That, that's not just a, uh, something that I'm saying. I'm inviting you to say amen, amen. Uh, so so I, 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 we, we have a lot of amens uh, in the township, and so, so we're used to that. And so please don't feel offended if I say amen a lot. It's, it's, not, it's not me trying to be in your space. I'm just, that's just how we do it. Amen. amen. <laughs> um, I just... <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just, it's just in me. I, I just, it's just going to come out. Um, verse 5, this is the word of the Lord, so let us listen. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. Verse 3, and he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little distance from the land. And he sat down and continued teaching the crowds from the boat. Verse 4, now when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon responded and said, master, we have worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish and their nets began to tear so that they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats to the point that they were sinking. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And likewise also were James and John and the sons of Zebedee who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and they followed him. Amen. I want to speak under the subject when grace convicts. When grace convicts. And I, I say that, as I say that, I'm aware that most of the time when we think about conviction, when we think about change, we can have this idea or this attitude that the more law we give to people, the more that they will change. The more that we tell people what's wrong, the more that we put that up, the more education we give, that's what people need to change. But I believe there's just a special way that Jesus changes us that's different. And, and that's what we desire as Christians, right? We all desire to change, we all desire to grow, we all desire to be more like Jesus, and we wanna be fundamentally and deeply changed, amen? That's, that's what we want, we wanna love Christ from the heart, we wanna be transformed from glory to glory, as Paul says, as we behold the face of Jesus, as we sung this morning, that's how we wanna change, amen? We don't wanna change, the, you know, the same way, you know, in, in the township, sometimes they'll have potholes, and sometimes when there's a pothole, they'll just fill it with sand. And, 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 and sometimes the rain will come, 
and then the sand will go away and you'll still have the same pothole that's there. We don't want superficial change, amen? We want deep change that comes from knowing, severing, and delighting in the Lord Jesus, amen? For us to be changed, we must know Jesus. We must know the real Jesus. And this is what I believe the brother Dane Odland, who wrote the book, Gentle and Lowly, this, this is the heart of why he wrote the book. He's trying to get us back to Christ. He's trying to get us back to see Jesus and how he treats sufferers and sinners. And so this is what he says, I quote, This is a book about the heart of Christ. Who is he? Who is he really? What is most natural to him? What ignites within him most immediately as he moves towards sinners and sufferers? What flows out most freely, most instinctively? Who is he? This is the most important thing because if we're going to be deeply changed, we're going to be changed by Jesus. It's not just knowing that Jesus loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, but it's actually believing And yes, I'll say it, experientially walking in the grace and the love of Jesus. It's easy to affirm that, yeah, God is gracious, yeah, God is good. But functionally, we can say that that he's dead, but you know what? It's because he hasn't dealt with a sinner like me. If he was truly to find out who I really am, he wouldn't want anything to do with me. He would cancel me like the Twitter streets do. He would never, ever use someone like me to achieve anything of spiritual worth. And so we normally settle for superficial change, where we're just kind of motivated by guilt, we're motivated by condemnation, we're motivated by by the law, and we never really change from the inside. And so Audlin's question of, of who Christ really is is important for us sinners. We need to go back and ask the question, can Jesus handle our mess? Can Jesus handle our inconsistencies? Can Jesus handle our weaknesses? Can he handle our failures? If we want to be changed by the gospel, if we're going to be changed by Jesus, we have to know who Jesus is. And so as we see Jesus interacting with normal folk, it's amazing in the gospels how he is. You see him, you know, interacting with people who are ungrateful. You see him interacting with people who are unbelieving. You see him interacting with people who are inconsistent. You find him incredibly gracious. He's incredibly gracious. He's very nuanced in how he deals with people. He can preach the gospel, but in John chapter 4, he can have an appointment with the woman at the well. Where John says he had to see her. He had to go past Samaria and meet her. And so when he meets the woman at the well, she goes to, his, to her story and she leaves Jesus. She's amazed by how can this guy who knows all I've done still want a relationship with me? With Zacchaeus, the tax collector, a reject of society, he's amazed by how Jesus is willing to have lunch with him. But with Peter, I see an unusually gracious way that he draws him. An unusually gracious way that he draws Peter. This is truly amazing. Jesus is on a class of his own in how he changes us, in how he draws us for his glory. He does it in a way that nobody else can do it. And this is important for us because grace and Jesus is not just a concept. We're not just changed by principles. We change by a person. And this person changes us in the daily realities of our life. He changes us in our marriages. There's marriages that need the oil of grace here this morning. There are relationships, strained relationships between staff and family that need the covering of grace. It's not so much that for us to be changed, man, sometimes we can say, I, maybe I need to just talk better. Let me not use this word when I'm talking to my wife or when I'm talking to this person. Let me try harder, you know to listen better, to be more compassionate. That's, that's not really, that doesn't change us deeply. What really changes us is a culture of grace. A culture of grace in our relationship. A culture of grace within the church. A culture of grace as we interact with non-Christians. In our text, I'm amazed by the unusually gracious manner in which Jesus calls Peter for ministry. So where we're going this morning, I see how Jesus invites Peter I see how he seeks Peter, I see how he convicts, and how he calls Peter. Let's first look at 
how he invites Peter. Look at chapter 5, verse 1 to verses 3. This is the picture now where Jesus is, has just gone from the wilderness. He's really just started his ministry. His ministry has started to be popular as he heals the sick, as he casts out demons. But here he's doing what he does. He's teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Standing by the lake of Gennesaret. But there's really two pictures that are happening here. While Jesus is preaching, while the crowds are pressing upon him and listening to the word of God, there's Peter here, there's Simon Peter, who has just worked with his companions all night and they're getting ready to go home because they didn't have a great day at the sea. From previous chapters, we see that Jesus has been doing ministry, he's been preaching, he's been casting our devils, healing the sick. Luke 4, 36, people are amazed as they hear the preaching accompanied with authority and power. Jesus knows that his time is short, and so he needs to have a group of men that he's going to hand the baton to. So he focuses on one of them by the name Simon Peter. Now the next chapter, chapter 6, he's going to call Simon. He's going to officially call the other disciples. But here he's drawing close to Simon. His focus is on Simon Peter. He, he, he zooms on that, and he likes doing that. Jesus loves doing that. Even though crowds are listening to him preach, even though he's preaching the gospel to many people, but yet he gives individual attention to Simon's story. He gives individual attention to Simon's issue. The picture here in chapter 5, verse 1 to 3, is that of fishermen who've been fishing, but they didn't have much luck the previous night. They're tired. They are tired. They're probably a little bit discouraged as well. Use their nets to fish. And the way that they would do it, they would row close to the waters closest to the shore and cast their net wide and deep, hoping for a catch. But they didn't catch anything. They did not catch anything. So we have a picture. On one hand, Jesus is preaching to the crowds. On the other hand, Peter and his companions are getting ready to go home. Jesus is aware of that. And as I said, he's aware of his calling and purpose to preach but he's also sensitive to Peter and his companions and what they're feeling. I have never been a fisherman. We didn't grow up in that tradition where we went fishing. But we went, uh, had an opportunity to go to, to Durban in, in December. And um, it was just a wonderful experience where, for the first time, I got to experience what fishing was like. And it, it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was exciting, but it was like confusing because it's like, why, why would you spend your time going to the ocean and just stand there and just wait? Like the waiting was just, um, man, I'm like, you just wait there. But then it was fascinating to me because every night then when we go to the sea, I would go up and I would have conversations with the fishermen and, and what they found interesting about fishing. And, and, you know, it's something that I think could grow on me, you know. It's something that one could begin to love because it, it's such a very humbling experience to be able to fish and wait. And so you got, I got to see from first hand how it can be disappointing, how it can be discouraging that when a fisherman has been out there, they would normally wait there in the evening, and then they catch nothing, and then they have to go home with nothing. So though today people have options for food, um, but you can tell the disappointment in the fisherman's face when they didn't catch anything. So Peter and companions are getting ready to go home, possibly with no meal for the day. They have nothing to show to their wives for the whole night of, of fishing. Jesus then strategically gets into Simon's boat and asks him to put his boat out a short distance from the land. It's been a long night, no lunch, the fishes, there's nothing anyone can do. Peter is thinking, let's go home, we'll see tomorrow. But Jesus decides to use Simon's boat as a pulpit. Jesus is stepping into Simon's story. Jesus has a whole life plan for Simon, but Simon has no idea. He has no idea what Jesus is planning to do with his life. Jesus likes doing that. He has this, this strange way of drawing us to himself, of inviting us to himself without being aware that he's already in our story. If you remember the woman at the well, look at how Jesus invited her. Jesus is not supposed to talk to the woman according to culture. But then Jesus goes, and whilst the woman is going to get water, 
He comes to her and says, give me a drink. He has no idea that Jesus is probably thinking about the many people that this woman has to go and preach to. He doesn't care about culture. He doesn't care that rabbis are not supposed to talk to women. He invites her. He gets into her story. Peter is tired and wants to pack the nets and boat and everything so he can go home. But Jesus steps into his ordinary life and shows amazing grace, not only in stepping to his story, but using his boat to preach. Can you say amen? amen? Simon must be amazed. But why, why, would, why would Jesus use my boat? This is, this, is, this is a funny story. If I think, I'm like, Simon is getting ready to go home. He's discouraged. Jesus is just getting started with Simon. Pastor Simon must be thinking, you're preaching to crowds, you're doing these amazing things, but I'm not sure if you know what's happening in my personal life right now. I wish I can passionately preach the gospel like you, Jesus, but I got bills to pay. The ones who are working can say amen. <laughs> Simon is thinking, I know you're spiritual, but I don't know outside this kingdom of God things if you, have, if you, can, if you know what it's like not to have fish, Jesus. Working hard with little pay, weakening economy, load shedding challenges. Does Jesus even know? Business going down challenges, dealing with leaders who don't do the right thing, but who have no control over them. It's like I know you're preaching the gospel right now, but I got no lunch because there's no fish. I have no control over the sea. Peter is discouraged, brothers and sisters. And I wonder if there's some amongst here this morning who are discouraged. You've put in the work. I've been talking to somebody yesterday, just on the phone. Almost a crisis of, what do I do when I've done everything they said I should do? I've come to church, I've tithed, but my life seems it's not going the right direction. I'm not married, and it doesn't seem like anything is working. Does Jesus actually care? As Jesus likes to do, he continues to confuse Peter further. Whilst busy using his boat to preach, I'm sure Peter is thinking there, thinking, hey, I wish this guy can end so I can go home, trying to explain to my wife that we didn't get anything. Jesus asks him to do something that does not make sense. Look at verse 4. Now when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. This is confusing. Peter is getting ready to go home. Jesus is saying, use the same boat. We've just worked all night. But you're saying, use the same boat to try again, to let down your, needs, your, your nets for a catch. A carpenter instructing a fisherman where to put their nets. <laughs> Jesus is asking something that's impossible in the natural. They have finished fishing. They found nothing. They were experts at fishing. They know that the night would be the best time to catch the fish when they would be on the shore in the daytime in the deep waters. Yet Jesus says, put out your net for a catch. He's been teaching all day, and now it's time for a lesson. Peter looks at the situation from a natural point of view. It has not dawned on him yet who Jesus is. But thank God that though it doesn't make sense to him, but he has sense enough to at least say, I'm going to do it because you said it. Look at verse 5. Simon responded and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. As if looking at Jesus, Jesus like, I'm, can you imagine looking at him? Then he says, but at your word, I will let down the nets. It is when Peter has come to the end of himself that Jesus begins to work. He will again learn this lesson the hard way when later he promises that he's not going to abandon Jesus and then he abandons him. Jesus will still seek him out after he feels like a total failure and wants nothing to do with Jesus after resurrection. By asking him to do something that is impossible in the natural, Jesus is not being sensitive, insensitive to what's going on. Jesus knows that the way to get Peter to believe who he is and what he can do is when ultimately Peter is at the end of himself. And we respond like Peter sometimes, right? 
Jesus, like, at least for us, is like, go plant a church in the township. That's what he says a couple of years back. And you are thinking, yo, <laughs> you grew up there and everybody's trying to get out of there for obvious reasons. But Jesus says, go plant a church there. Start giving more when you have a budget that does not allow you to give more. It's like, Jesus, do you not see the bills? Do you not see? Start a business, right? No, I, I don't know this person. I don't know that person. Pray for your wife or pray for, 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 for your dying spouse. The doctors say there's no hope, Jesus. I, there's nothing we can do. We respond like this. It's what we do when God calls us for certain assignments. We answer according to what we know and according to what we have. I'm sick. I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. Peter puts out the net not because he's confident it will work, but he's doing it because Jesus said it. But you see, Jesus is pursuing Peter. He's seeking out Peter. He wants to reveal himself to Peter. But he can't do it until Peter recognizes he can't do it by himself. Jesus must get Peter to look to him, not to his own resources. Look at the result. Verse 6, and when they had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats to the point that they were sinking. So much supply, they couldn't handle it. How is this possible in the natural? From a human standpoint, how is it possible? I ask myself, how, how does this happen? Did Jesus create new fish on the spot? Did he send a signal to the fish at the bottom to come up? Did the fish come up when Jesus stepped on the water? How, I don't know how he does it. But Jesus has a thousand ways of coming through for us. He can cause something to happen when there's nothing. He has power over nature. The miracle would not have made sense to Zacchaeus. It would not have made sense to the woman at the well, but for Peter, this was huge. How can Jesus be so gracious towards him when he's not deserving? But this is who Jesus really is. That's how, that's how he naturally is. He seeks us out when we're not aware, and he shows up in unbelievable ways. Jesus is not out there watching to see if we measure up. And then if we don't, like our earthly fathers, he pulls us a cane and beats us and withdraws his love and favor. No. Rather, he, he's on a mission to draw us to himself so we can see more and more of his grace and character so that we can be useful on the mission field. We've got to know something of the grace of God for us to be useful to people. We've got to experience it in our lives before we can show it to others. It's when we surrender and confess our tiredness, our discouragement and need of him that he shows up in incredible ways. So at this stage, people are amazed. There's a, there's a credible ocean basket meal. Everyone is getting fish. <laughs> Everyone is just taking their spoils. Peter is not focusing on the blessing. He focuses on himself. He looks at the blessing and looks at what Jesus has done. And as if he has an Isaiah moment, chapter 6. And he's thinking, this is too much grace. This is too much grace. I don't deserve this. Look at his response, verse 8. But when Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' name, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. Peter is convicted. Peter sees the miracle. He sees his unbelief and it breaks him. No law was preached to expose his sin. Though there's a place for the law, no threatenings were made to Peter. It was the ridiculous favor of God that broke him. Jesus used his boat to call him as a disciple, challenged his knowledge of a profession he was an expert on, and showed him that he's even Lord over the sea. That's what drew him. That's what humbled him. It's the gracious provision of Jesus. Have you ever had Jesus show up in, gracious, in a gracious and undeserving manner? Have you seen Jesus show up for you? It is such a humbling experience. You're like, Lord, I've messed up big time. Like, take your spirit away from me. 
I'm not worthy of your spirit. Jesus then shows up and says, you know what? No, I still want to have fellowship with you. Showing you grace at your lowest, that's what I do. That's who I am. That's what naturally flows out of me. Like I don't even believe you can provide. Not only did you not provide, but you still want to be with me. You still want to live in my heart. You still like me. You're still pursuing me. I don't even pray and read my Bible as I should, but you still want to be with me. And we experience this in such incredible ways with our church. When he's planted the church and the township um, in, in Mamilodi, as I said, it was, such a, it was such an experience. Firstly, I've got to convince my wife that we've got to go back. Um, and, and by God's grace, um, after praying and after waiting and talking, she finally said we should go. So when we went to plant the church, uh, we obviously didn't have a core team. That's what you do when you plant a church. You have people that go with you. We just waited and waited. Nobody was going to do it. And so we just, you know what? We're going to do it the old evangelist way. We're just going to go and knock on doors and give out flyers um, around 2016, 2017. And so we did that, and it was difficult. It was difficult because, you know, these books that talk about how, you know, when you do the right thing, when you're the biblical church and you, you preach the text and you're not, you're not taking advantage of people, people are going to come. We didn't experience this. Like, whoa. People think we're the strange church because we don't, like, I didn't even budget for that. And so it's difficult during that time. But then lockdown happened, which was a negative thing for the whole country, for the whole world. But it was amazing that it was the very lockdown that was negative that God uses to grow our church. Public, public school system was struggling. A lot of kids were getting behind in terms of their homework. They didn't have internet. They don't have all these things. And so my wife starts discipling three girls at home. My wife is very good with maths and science and stuff. And so they start doing that stuff. It starts keeping them accountable, you know, in terms of obeying their parents and the work and stuff. Something that, you know, it's insignificant. That's just, it's just lockdown and let's just help as much as we can. But amazingly, God grows the thing from three girls to now, what, 120 on Saturdays in terms of the tutoring. And it's just incredible. And we look at that and we're like, what, what was that? What, what, just, what just happened? And so towards the end of last year, we, we grew in our church and the Lord brings couples, he brings people, and this is what we've been praying for. And so now there's so much growth. We're trying to get leaders, we're trying to get people trained up. It's, it's, not, it's not that easy. But as we reflect on that, it's humbling because you guys are probably thinking that you're thinking we are mavericks, we are with these great people. We had a very difficult year last year. It's not because of us. My wife was diagnosed with cancer in 2021. So the whole of last year, she's going to chemo, she's going to radiation. People are expecting us to minister to them at church. If you know the township, you know the many needs, you know how people put up the pastor. We're not there. We're facing all kinds of temptation and challenges in our own personal space. It's very, very difficult. It's very difficult for us. We're tired. We didn't feel like going to church at times. You know, it's bad when the pastor doesn't want to go to church. <laughs> Sorry for those who are part of our church. It's times where I didn't feel like going to church. I was like, Lord, can I just do a recording and let them hear? I just, it was just so discouraged, so difficult. But that's the lesson we had to learn, that his love and his provision for us is not based on how good you are, or your efforts, or your skills, or your strategies. It's based on his faithfulness to his promises and grace toward us. And if, amen, praise the Lord. And as if that was not enough, you look at how Jesus then calls Peter. Not only does he invite him, not only does he seek him, not only does he convict him, but then he calls him to ministry. What grace. Look at verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at his Jesus' knees, going away from, go away from me, Lord, for I am sinful. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And likewise also were James and John and sons of Zebedee who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. Do not fear, Simon. From now on, 
you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Verse 10, and likewise also were James and John and sons of Zebedee who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, because you doubted me, you don't qualify to be in ministry, Peter. Is that what he says? Do not fear. From now on, you will be catching people. Jesus does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He uses mouthy, he uses opinionated, unbelieving people to draw others to himself. For some, this is bad, this is risky, this is, this is shaky, this is not good. We've got to keep it right, let's get our best people out there, the best skill. But for some of us, this is gold. This is precious. This is precious. Jesus says you will now be catching people. The word catch literally means to capture a life. Stephen Cole notes, although in their vocation the fish they caught would die, in their new focus, dead men would be caught and come alive for Jesus. Interesting that he uses their own terminology to describe their new occupation. You are going to be fishers of men. You're going to toil, Peter, night and day, crying, not in your own strength, but crying for Jesus to save men now. That is the assignment that he then gives Peter. It's the same assignment that he gave Paul, and Paul expresses the same kind of amazement. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful putting me into service even though I was previously a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown grace. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly and in unbelief. Amen. This ought to increase our love for Jesus, surely. This ought to increase our love for Jesus. I know that there's people that might say, it's, it's, it's the law, it's the preaching of the law. Let's keep that the focus. And there's a place for that. There's other places where Jesus uses the law to convict people. So we're not saying we're doing away with the law. But in showing the gracious nature of Jesus, we're asking a different question. And this, this Dane Odland helps us with balancing the law, the wrath, and the mercy of Christ. This is what he says, I quote. The wrath of Christ and the mercy of Christ are not at odds with one another. Like a seesaw, one diminishing to the degree that the other is held up. Rather, the two rise and fall together. The more robust ones felt, the more robust ones felt understanding of the just wrath of Christ against all that is evil, both around and within us, the more robust our felt understanding of his mercy. In speaking specifically of the heart of Christ and the heart of God in the Old Testament, we are not really on the wrath mercy spectrum anyway. His heart is his heart. When we speak of Christ's heart, we are not so much speaking of one attribute alongside of others. We are asking, who is he most deeply? What pulls out of him most naturally? Then he says, it is impossible for the affectionate heart of Christ to be over-celebrated, made too much of, or exaggerated. This ought to increase our love for Jesus. But secondly, this ought to make us more gracious toward others. We are so merit-based in how we treat other people. We treat people according to merit. And our wives, our children, our colleagues sometimes are the recipients of our wrath. They're the recipients of how sometimes they, they don't, because they don't measure up, therefore they are now taken out. But no matter how bad they can mess up, no matter how bad people mess up, no matter how bad people can offend you, or don't keep their word, or don't measure up. People must not get the impression that we only deal with them on the basis of them being good or measuring up. Amen. We must be grace dispensers. Yes. Yes. We must treat people with what John Piper calls future grace, right? Yes. You can see somebody acting crazy right now. It's like, man... I don't understand, uh, my wife, my husband, what you're doing, how it's going these days, but I'm going to love you now. You might not deserve it right now, or you might not feel like, but I'm going to give you grace now, future grace right now. So that's what I've been asking myself. How does it look like to give grace? 
How does it look like for me to give grace to the undeserving? How does it look like for me to give grace to people that have messed up? Because I know that I've messed up. But how does it look like to actually give grace to people? This ought to make us excited about telling others about Jesus. Surely. Peter in Acts is not the same person as in the Gospels. He's grown, he's, he's growing, and when you see him preaching Acts 2, after people have, you know, the Holy Spirit has been poured out, you hear him make a statement and telling people that, that, that the Jesus whom you crucified, this is the same Jesus that has now risen. And you're reading that and you're thinking, what do you mean, Peter? You were also involved. You also denied him. But Jesus has done such a work of restoration in his life that he can limp but still preach. His flaws may be visible for others, but he can still point to, to, G, to people to Jesus who uses people with flaws. And so you get to understand when he opens up his epistle by, by giving glory to God's work and character in 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, Simon Peter, a born servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of God our Savior. Not my own righteousness. Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied. Yes. Verse 2, to you. In the knowledge of God, of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, for his divine power has granted, passive tense, has granted us, not because of my own strength, not because of my own ability to follow Jesus, I have been granted everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and excellence. It is grace. It is God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. It's amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved the wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found. It's blind, but now I see. If you're here and like Peter, you've come to the end of yourself. You're tired. You feel like giving up. Grace is available. Grace is available. Grace is available for you this morning. Jesus is the one person that is fully committed to walk the long journey with you. Fully committed. He does not wait for you to get it together. But he invites you. He seeks you. He convicts you and then calls you for his purpose. This is the picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. It's invitation. Look at him hanging on the cross inviting us. It's conviction as we look at him and we're like, we put him there. But it's also calling as he calls us. To now, because we've received this grace, he's now calling us and saying, go and show others this grace also. May God keep transforming us by his grace. Let's